Welcome to Living Blind. I'm your host, Naomi Hazlitt, and this podcast is brought to you by Balance for Blind Adults, located in Toronto, Canada. This season of Living Blind is sponsored by AMI. Here at Living Blind, we explore the perspectives and lived experiences of people with sight loss and delve into barriers, challenges, and real-life strategies for living life to the fullest. For today's episode, we're talking about accessibility of museums and art galleries. We know that access to these spaces is important for a number of reasons, and that has certainly changed with the global pandemic. We sat down with John Ray and Melissa Smith, two people that are making the changes necessary for it to happen. Our first guest is a well-known advocate in the GTA for blind and low vision folks. He previously worked for Ontario Public Service, has been a board member of many human and disability rights organizations, and was honored with a medal from the Ontario Historical Society for his efforts to make museums, art galleries, and other historic properties more accessible. We are so happy to have Mr. John Ray with us. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you. Maybe we can start from the beginning when you were talking about how important it is to have tactile experiences in museums. So I've heard that you can use gloves or there's other strategies for for preserving the artifacts. Is that something you've come across in your experience? Definitely. Uh, Gloves are a way. And... uh they protect the item from the oils that are on your hands. It does work. It's not my first choice. I I would uh, prefer to be able to touch the item without gloves, but uh, if that's what it's going to take, I will happily wear gloves. I, I remember when I was at what is really my my favorite museum experience at the Nie Carlsberg Glyptotech in Copenhagen, Denmark, a private a private museum that houses statuary from various ancient civilizations. It's a very big place, and uh, most of it, when I was there many years ago was out in the open. There was lots there to touch. And I was uh, enjoying myself, touching anything, everything to my heart's content when a a staff person came up to me and very quietly said to me, would you mind putting on a pair of gloves to protect the, the items? And I said, okay. And I did and continued uh examining this wonderful statuary. So yes, gloves are a a way of uh, providing access and protecting the items as well. Mm -hmm. I think you already answered the next question I was going to ask, which is, you know, in your opinion, what would be the best museums for tactile access to their exhibits? I have found that museums in England are often pretty good. The the Glyptotech, as I've said, is definitely my favorite. Although um, the other places where I've done fairly well, often what we could call uh, pioneer museums or old old uh, houses are uh, quite accessible. Uh, The uh, Black Creek Pioneer Village, just outside of Toronto, there's quite a bit there to touch. Um, The museum in Edmonton uh, has a lot to touch. The the old fort uh, outside of Winnipeg. These, these, These pioneer villages, they often have quite a lot to touch, old implements or old vehicles or uh, a chance to visit old buildings that may have been uh, residences of uh, important people or churches or or, or school rooms. Uh, usually you c- 
can go into a selection of buildings and uh, just being able to go in them and walk around in them and uh, sometimes these uh, facilities will have uh, individuals in period costumes who uh, act like people who lived at the time that uh, the structure is depicting life, and I always find them fun because they're usually they usually they usually tell some funny stories and really bring to life the era that you're visiting. Makes sense to me. You know, it, it's uh, more of a living scenery, you know, a place of living scenery, a place that's more active. I've definitely experienced that at uh, Black Creek Pioneer Village that they let you kind of play with things or touch things a little bit more than say the Royal Ontario Museum. Yeah, these Pioneer Villages tend to be quite in a, quite interactive uh, and uh, you, you get to experience life as it uh, was back in uh, the 19th century, I guess, 18th century mm -hmm. here in Canada and in other countries. On the other uh, side of things, what's your experience been like with um, art galleries or art museums? Well, they're tougher because you can't really touch a piece of art. It, it's, it's flat. And so that's where raised line drawings or models or uh, good audio tours come in handy. Uh, I personally prefer uh, historic uh, facilities with statuary. Uh, that, that's what I prefer. I'm, I'm a history lover, but uh, I, I have come to appreciate art galleries. In, in the beginning, I sort of assumed that there wouldn't be anything of great interest to me as a blind person in an art gallery. A after all, you know, what am I going to get out of a painting? Of course, some art galleries also have statuary. And uh, a skilled docent or guide can do a good job of explaining what is contained in the painting. And in my mind, there's no rules of how to do it. Some of them start at the top uh, left-hand quadrant of the painting and go around the painting. That works. Others will start with what they consider the most important aspect of the painting and describe what they feel is really happening in the painting. They, they jump right in. That also works. Because remember, the important thing is to convey to us who cannot see uh, what the painting actually is trying to convey. And chances are they've done some research and have some insights into what the artist is actually trying to convey. Of course, looking at a painting is a reasonably subjective exercise. And different people may have different ideas of what's going on or why the painter uh, decided to paint that particular scene or what the painter is trying to convey. That's fine. That's why it's, it's sometimes very useful to have a couple of docents doing the description you may, you may get a different perspective from more than one person. I think that's fine. If I get more than one perspective, 
I then piece it together and, you know, develop my, my own idea. I have found art galleries can work if you have a, a good uh, guide, someone who is really good at describing. And one of the nice things I have found is, is that these tend to become a win-win situation. Guides who are preparing to describe a painting for us tend to look at it in more detail than they might otherwise because they they need to you know come up with a perspective of what what's going on and they often say that they have gained a deeper understanding of what they are describing to us i'm always happy when that happens. I'm always happy to participate in what turns out to be a win-win situation. I'm always glad when uh, these guides or docents uh, also also gain from their their efforts to describe a painting and make it come to life for me. It's a good point. Is that that can benefit them and it can create a richer learning experience for everyone who comes to a museum or art gallery. I'm always happy when uh, that happens. And uh, a number of uh, times the, the person who was working with me or with a group has uh, said that to me. I'm always happy when that, ha when that occurs. I guess my last question would be, you know, do you have any advice for anyone listening in right now and taking in what you're saying about museums and wanting to go or wanting to know what to expect or what they should be asking for? Uh, my advice is plan your trip. Try and get a sense of uh, what's available. Uh, let the facility know that you'd like to have a tour because if you just show up unannounced, you you may be very disappointed. But if you call in advance and uh, explore what they can do for you as a blind person, uh, chances are your uh, visit will be much more useful and much richer. And of course, some of us also organize groups and and some places offer group tours on a periodic basis. So take a look at their website and uh, see what they offer. Many places now have an accessibility section and uh, that will often provide information about uh, any organized tours that are aimed particularly at the disabled community. And I also encourage people to uh, offer their services to uh, help advise uh, your local facility. Uh, sometimes they have advisory committees. Most of them will have a board. Uh, the more that we participate, the more these places will become aware of our needs and desires to take part. So it's like most uh, other aspects of life. The more we are visible, the more we try to take part. And of course, the more that these places uh, incorporate diversity into their regular programs, the more that we see ourselves in a facility, the more that we will be interested in attending. And these days, all museums, art galleries, and historic properties are looking to expand their clientele. We are an untapped part of communities who often do not go to these places. We are a potential source of new patrons. Well, this can be 
a win-win situation again by becoming more involved uh, we can benefit hopefully through greater access and inclusion and these facilities can benefit by having us as the real experts on what is needed to make access a re- and inclusion a reality and i think i think that's a win-win situation for all facilities and all members of any community but for me as a blind person there is simply no substitute to tactile access that's what i'm really looking forward to sometimes i get it and sometimes i'm very disappointed well i think like i said you've given us a lot to think about thanks a lot my pleasure And now a message from our sponsor. Discover AMI's collection of podcasts created by and for the blind and partially sighted community. Visit ami.ca to learn more. AMI entertains, informs, and empowers. And now back to the podcast. Our next guest, Melissa Smith, is currently the Assistant Curator of Access and Learning at the Art Gallery of Ontario. In her work, she advocates for underrepresented communities, collaborates on strategies, builds partnerships, and co-creates experiences that support lowering perceived and physical barriers to the art gallery and its collections. Welcome to the podcast, Melissa. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Can you start by telling the listeners a little bit about yourself? So um, my name is Melissa Smith, and I'm the Assistant Curator of Access and Learning at the Art Gallery of Ontario. I've been there for almost nine years, which is something to note. Um, And my background is in um, museum studies and art history. Uh, So kind of fits with working in galleries. Um, And I do a lot of work that's super focused on visitors and engagement. Um, and just, yeah, kind of lowering any perceived or physical barriers to the AGO and the collection. How did you get started in this kind of work? How did you get interested in it? Actually, you know, I I went to an arts high school in Ottawa called Canterbury um, and fell in love with visual arts, and then I sort of just pursued that through undergrad. I um, just kind of fell into art history from there, Um, I did my uh, master's in art history at Western and then quickly decided that I (laughs) didn't want to pursue academia anymore. And then when I went back to Ottawa, I was lucky enough to get uh, positions in Library Archives Canada, the Diefenbucker Cold War Museum, and then the National Gallery. Um, And it was really at the National Gallery that I kind of uh, found my passion, um, which is really about when you engage with someone around an art piece and someone has what we call like an aha moment where they're like, oh my God, like this is so not what I expected or I'm seeing this in a new way. Um, and that's something I find really deeply exciting. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm getting excited about it as well. <laughs> I mean, I, we, we talked before the show too and it already got me very interested. I mean, this is all new for me. So I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Sounds great. (laughs) So can we start from the beginning? Can you walk me through how you might adapt uh, a museum or an art exhibit for a person with vision loss or another disability? Absolutely. And I mean, I think uh, what I want to start off by saying too, is that right now we can do much better, but what's in place (laughs) is very much Um, something that was came out of art education for the blind uh, from the states actually Uh, and most museums usually provide engagement for uh, the spaces through programming which looks like guided tours that often have audio visual description tactile elements um, and usually activations around sound um, and optional scent as well Uh, So they're usually seen as multi-sensory tours and uh, often given by an art educator or someone who's affiliated with the museum. Uh, So that's also what we do. And we've been running a program like that since 2010. And a lot of the training and work around those um, forms of engagement came out of a report and work that Elizabeth Sweeney 
um, did at the National Gallery. And the report that they created then went out across Canada. So I know the Vancouver Art Gallery, the National Gallery, and also the AGO. And I'm sure there's others, but um, just based on my memory right now, <laughs> that, that's how uh, most programs are created. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying right now, there's these programmed multi-sensory to uh, tours that people can access, although maybe not right right now because of the pandemic, but generally speaking, that's something that people can, can do when they go to an art gallery or museum, hopefully, hopefully soon. What about, do you ever get involved in ways to make the space accessible or the experience accessible for somebody who say was just dropping in? Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, a lot of this work is relational as well, right? Because there's not really one way or one answer. Um, and I feel really strongly about that because it has to be sort of a relational model, um, which is sometimes challenging within an institutional construct. But usually what I'm doing is I'm working directly with anyone that reaches out to me. Um, and I also liaise from time to time with, um, with uh, the exhibition teams I would say that as a standard within um, museums, usually it's something called the Smithsonian guidelines that folks work off of for accessibility. And then it becomes a sort of provincial thing. So in Ontario, we have the ODA requirements. So exhibition designers will set up the space in the most inclusive way possible. And then programming on top of that is something that becomes more relational and is about, for instance, um, managing bright lights, or anything like that. Um, and I'm just also thinking about quiet hours, which extends past uh, the communities we're talking about today. But that's really um, how we kind of work around what an exhibition is like to create access to those spaces. Another really good example, too, is right now um, a partnership that we formed with Blind Square, which uh, is based in the CNIB. And we are piloting working with that particular app to create access to our upcoming Warhol exhibition at the AGO. Um, and I also work in writing audiovisual description with community members and lots of different stakeholders. So our curator reviews that, our interpretive planner reviews that. And then I work with some folks also to ensure that that communication is clear. So nothing for us without us. Uh, but uh, yeah, so. Those are also ways that uh, we try and create access that's self-determined on top of the pre-booked, pre-programmed tours and other engagements. With the blind square, can that be combined with the audio-visual descriptions that you were talking about? I, can you maybe tell me a little bit more about how the blind square piece uh, works? Sure. So um, Blind Square is kind of a GPS activated app that responds to beacons that we've installed in the museum. It has wayfinding orientation bits. And then you can also go a bit further and hear from our labels. And then from there, you can also hear the audiovisual description. So those will be loaded onto the app. Um, we also provide uh, high contrast QR codes near the artworks that are a part of that tour that can also be used to access the particular audio uh, visual description. Uh, and so we're, that, those are ways where I'm very keen to try and ensure that there's agency and a person can decide to come to the gallery that day and have an experience rather than needing to book because we're a union environment two to three weeks out for a tour, right? So mm -hmm. um, that's important to me to create agency. You know, you've talked a lot about ways that you're trying to make art galleries, exhibitions more accessible, um, both from the perspective of something more guided or planned, as well as things that are available to everybody who are visiting. Why don't we talk about what you think museums and art galleries could do better? Uh, a lot. <laughs> I think there's a lot we can do better. Um, again, it, it's very much a human right for me to have access to the spaces. And I mean, we have that kind of captured within um, sort of our, our charter of human rights. 
uh, the Canadian Human Rights Act, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and then more recently, the Accessible Canada Act. And it's really about prohibiting the discrimination of any, anything um, to create access for anyone who identifies with a disability. And it's really important to me that we try and create space that's very accessible at any time, because it's also museums we've identified as being able to improve well-being, really tackling any kind of complex challenges uh, around medical stuff as well. So there's also a whole movement in the UK for prescription to art that's around arts and culture. It's really about connecting with groups and like really fostering um, community engagement. And so it's, it's super important in that regard. And I think that we need to move past just kind of checking boxes to make it accessible and really start to work towards that relational model and moving past even universal design to get to a place where we're actually responding and ensuring that everyone feels welcome and able to access culture. Because we know, I mean, the World Health Organization, lots of different people have identified how being around creativity, either generated by yourself or someone else, um, actually improves your well-being through positive engagement, through lots of things. And so um, that's why I'm pretty passionate about ensuring that we get past just, um, it, yeah, again, um, meeting the bare minimum and envisioning ways to, uh, to get everyone through those doors. I know we're talking a little more specifically around people with visual impairments, but what would be some things that you would like art galleries or museums to start doing that they're not now and you can speak to either visual impairment or I guess any other disability that comes to mind because our, our listeners come from many different walks of life. For sure I mean I have such a, a laundry list uh, maybe I'll start with some of the things that I, I feel can so like quiet hours for instance visual narratives for accessing different elements of the building um, and updating those regularly so that they represent exhibitions and, and how to and manage expectations for the space. That can also be audio, right? Not just um, visual. I think uh, I'm, I'm excited about our pilot with Blind Square because I think that it's manifesting that interest in creating like self-guided options. But I'm also really keen to see raised um, elements on the floor to help guide towards tactile um, moments. So increasing that in any space is really important. And, and I think we chatted too. I was lucky enough to be part of a delegation that went to France to see some really incredible installations at, at the Musem, the Museum of uh, the Mediterranean in Marseille, for instance. They have an entire trail that you can follow with raised lines on the floor, bringing you and guiding you directly to tables that have audio descriptions, they have ASL interpretation, they have representations of key objects within that installation reproduced as 3D models in bronze, which is a naturally antiseptic material. So they become these kind of lookout points where you have access to lots of ways of engaging in one place. Um, and that to me is really incredible, again, because that provides agency to visit in your own pace, in your own way, to choose different ways to access those objects. Um, the one thing I would say about that though, is that there was no community consultation. So you have all these really rich, beautiful installations, um, but I, don't, I, I didn't see tons of folks using it because there wasn't engagement with community. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's also what museums need to be doing better as well around this work is from the beginning, <laughs> working with community stakeholders. Um, and I won't even get into an accessibility strategy, but even working with community stakeholders to develop uh, ways to engage with exhibitions and ensuring that that's something that meets folks expectation to be able to to come to the space and feel comfortable mm -hmm. so like you were saying before nothing about us without us is really at the core of this sort of work yeah and I mean the thing too is like having worked in the field for as long as I have and specifically in working for community engagement and advocacy there's things I can recommend based on having worked with community members and knowing but that 
is also me as an able-bodied person in a role advocating when we need to have more employment and representation of folks who identify with disabilities in the workforce as well. So I wanna share that because I think it's really important that museums do more of that work. It's also a labor crisis that we should just address as a nation, but um, that's also key because I think that's the only way for us to remain relevant as um, institutions because we do come from a very strong colonial background and uh, we need to engage better with lots of different communities <laughs> to be able to yeah, remain relevant. And we have the ability through art and cultural objects to have conversations about the past, the present, and really help re-envision a future, right? And so I think it's also our responsibility, not only for keeping objects in perpetuity, but also for ensuring that we can have those conversations and create kind of contact zones where we can make change. Um, and that's really what I feel most passionately about as far as access as well. Well, well said. <laughs> I know you already spoke to this a little bit already, but what could a partially sighted or blind person expect when they visit a museum or out art gallery, say where you work or ones that you have worked in the past or are familiar with? So really at the point of sale, um, Often uh, when folks come, there's usually uh, different uh, strategies for ticket payment. Often if you have someone that's accompanying you, for instance, um, as a guide, that person um, should be able to get in free. Um, and then there's usually also different ticketing strategies because I can't speak to all spaces um, to provide access in that way. Usually uh, museums provide a large print versions of special exhibitions and labels. I know there's also uh, museums that provide app engagements that um, text readers can engage with or you have audio elements as well. Um, I know the AGO we're in the midst of developing that and so that's also why we're excited to pilot Blind Square because it helps uh, navigate that space. Um, so then you would probably move if you're coming to see the permanent collection. It depends on what kind of strategies have been put into that. And a permanent collection is the stuff that the gallery owns that's often on view for a longer period of time. They usually rotate at our site every three years or so. And they are um, key pieces in the collection. And then if you're visiting for a special exhibition, that's usually an exhibition that's been co-created with other institutions. Um, and those usually have audio guides a bit more. Um, those are usually the ones that are represented a bit more with large print binders as well. Um, there's also, I work with a, a large group of uh, gallery guides who are volunteers and some sites also call them docents. And so they're usually floating around <laughs> with ask me buttons or will approach if, uh, if folks look like they are, they're a bit puzzled to help people move through the building and also to share extra insights about uh, the gallery, the exhibitions. No idea what that's gonna look like post pandemic, but we also used to run free hourly tours as well in that regard. Um, you might also uh, go to some sites where they have volunteers who also are offering up objects. So I know my colleagues at the ROM do a really great job of running a program where um, some volunteers will be on the floor in certain exhibitions and have a specimen that you're able to engage with and touch, um, which is really neat. And that's also interesting when we think about ethnographic museums versus art galleries, because usually ethnographic museums have trays of stuff. And art galleries have that one Picasso, so and it's flat. So it's also it it depends on what kind of site you're visiting as well. But I would say that for the most part, it's it's usually through those programming, the multi-sensory tours, that you get the best experience, and through pilots. As I've, I keep repeating it, but I guess I'm just really excited about it. <laughs> is Blind Square too? Because again, I, I'm really keen to create uh, self agency. Mm -hmm. Is that a good snapshot? A bit. Then there's I, the gift shop, because you can go to the gift shop and touch all sorts of stuff in there. Yeah, I think the tactile piece I'm still curious about, and it sounds like that will really vary depending on the museum or the gallery that you're going to. I can imagine with a place like the Royal Ontario Museum, they might have some replicas of more three-dimensional objects or artifacts with paintings, 
it would probably depend on how much texture the artist would put into it or kind of the nature of the art project, if that could translate in some way to a tactile experience, right? It's a challenge with that kind of flat 2D work. How do you translate that aside from raised line drawings that we've kind of learned over time aren't super effective and you also have to kind of learn to read them? Um, how do we translate an artwork in the most multi-sensorial way if it's something that's already been produced? So I actually work with students from a range of backgrounds. So they can be industrial designers, they can be artists, um, and they're pursuing a graduate degree in that inclusive design field. So they're also like a design element to what they're working on. And we work with folks from the community and we run a co-design <laughs> around particular artworks. And then the students and uh, those representatives co-create translations of those artworks. And usually what we would do is we would then be on the floor on a free Wednesday night and set up next to where the artworks are to be able to share a visual audio description and then the prototypes that the students have come up with. And they seem to be more diorama 3D representations of the artworks that usually seems to be where folks end up. Um, but we've also had uh, filmmakers that have made like an audio narrative that really represented kind of the, the rise and denouement of a story. Um, and we've also had folks engage with scent. We've had people engage in haptic uh, representations of artworks. And so with the pandemic, actually, what we did is we shifted to um, a series called Multisensory Museum Moments, where students recorded videos where they included their visual audio description of the artwork. And then they created a visual audio description of the prototypes that they actually still made. Um, and so in the before times, what would happen is those prototypes would actually come into the AGO Multisensory um, Education and Programming Collection, so we could incorporate those into our tours. Um, and then in the aftertimes, <laughs> what we've done is that those videos live on our AGO Access to Art page. Um, and you can actually search them on our webpage too. And there's a series of 12. Uh, but that's that's also a thing that's sort of been what we've kind of been talking around is I'm, I'm not entirely sure how things are going to look in post pandemic because certainly there's a real avoidance of touch and the tactile element of our multi-sensory tours were really important because I work closely with curators and um, conservationists to identify artworks in the collection that we can touch so that there's not a translation. There's not, you know, either through an audio description or through a 3D print or a diorama or a recreation of the work so that, again, you can have the same experience that you can touch the artwork. Um, and I'm just not sure how that's going to manifest uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll just have to have another interview, I guess, <laughs> in a year from now. And you'll let me know what, uh, what creative solutions have come up along the way. But I think that using tactile sensation is a really important part of the multi-sensory experience. And so I hope in the future, although we may not know what that looks like right now, we will find ways to incorporate that again into the experience of going to uh, an art gallery museum. Oh, I, I trust me, <laughs> I will be advocating for that quite, quite intensely. And I think also like when we're doing those tactile moments, we encourage people to wear nitro gloves because um, our hands do have oils um, on them that can over time on objects uh, start like create a decomposition thing. Um, so we have to just be careful about keeping objects, uh, again, because that's museums, we want to keep them for as long as we can, which is something we can question or not, but <laughs> all that to say, um, so we have used nitro gloves, so I'm going to kind of advocate for that element being what will uh, let us get back in the saddle and start again, and I think also we're talking as an institution already about hybrid models, so one thing that I, I don't want to underestimate or undermine is the uh, impact of having shifted to a digital platform because I've noticed on our multi-sensory moment videos, for instance, that we're connecting with on average around 3,000 people. So where on a multi-sensory tour, we could engage with maybe five to eight people um, where I feel like there's an impact that I don't want to lose um, from that programming. Um, 
while, while also acknowledging the digital divide too. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I think what museums can be doing better is creating multiple ways to access in a variety <laughs> of, of platforms. Hmm. All right, well, last but not least, what do you think is the most important part of your work? I mean, for me, the most important part is the representation of our humanity, I think, through art and culture objects. And I think it's really important that we have time with things from the past and you know, contemporary art as well, because it gives us pause. I think there's a mindfulness in that when you're engaging with an object or a visual object or visual description that helps us think about, like there's not a lot of other creatures on this planet that make art or take time to create the objects that are around us. There's something super telling about that. And I find artists are often folks who are really thoughtful and engaged in what's happening in their cultural moment. And at a time where we find ourselves trying to re-envision the way that we've structured the world, um, I think it's incredibly important to be around that art and be around culture to see what we've done before. Again, as I've said, to think about it in the present and to help re-envision a better future. And as kind of contact zones, contact objects, you can have conversations around art that I, it just blow my mind. And I mean, there's moments too, just to share, I also work with um, the Alzheimer's Society and there's more than I can count on my hands moments where we've seen somebody who um, has maybe perhaps been nonverbal for a very long period of time and opening up around an art piece. Um, or you know, even during a visual description, the conversations that happen on the tours afterwards to better comprehend what that art object looks like quickly move into interpretation and conversations about things around us. So to me, it's about making those connections um, around people and, and being inspired by what we could actually really do as, as the human race. That is so exciting to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about music therapy for folks with dementia or Alzheimer's, but I hadn't thought about using visual art to elicit those emotions attached to memories and, and other feelings about the piece. So that is really neat. The, the program really started from Meet Me at MoMA, which has this incredible website that you can see all of this incredible research they did as well. And I know, again, it was a program that started at the AGO around 2010, where uh, we worked closely with MoMA to develop it. And we've, it's been a longstanding uh, partnership because it, you really can see tangible, um, it, it really, art activates your brain and your synapses in a different way, it, like kind of fires up your brain. And even talking about it, even being around it, even engaging in some form of creativity, um, and that's a, why I keep calling out the notion of well-being, because if we think about health holistically, then having access to arts and culture um, is incredibly important. Absolutely. So is there anything that you want to mention that we haven't talked about yet before you wrap up? I don't think so. <laughs> is there anything you want me to share? I know you said you wanted to talk about human rights. I just wanted to make sure you had said whatever piece that you wanted to say about that. I think I fumbled over it, but I think it's there, really. Right. I mean, the only other thing I would say is just um, there is like actually a review of empirical literature that concluded that engagement with artistic activities, either as an observer or of the creative efforts of others or as an initiator of their own creative efforts can enhance mood, emotions, and other psychological states. And the WHO found, so the World Health Organization found that art specifically has positive overall effects for mental and physical health at all stages of life, which is just, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's why we need to create access. Yeah, that's why we need the arts. We need to, you know, I feel like uh, arts advocacy is a huge, piece as well in terms of explaining why it's important. I think you provided really great reasons, whether it's the well-being, whether it's the fact that everyone should have the right to participate in culture and engage with 
hard, whether it's doing it yourself or creating it. So I guess all that is to say is that it is important for us, right, to continue to advocate for that access, whether it's listeners, whether it's Melissa, whether it's me, you know, as allies to do that. So I hope we continue to do that going into the future. For sure, because it's all a structure we can undo. <laughs> there is no reason we need to maintain status quo. There is no reason we have to maintain any of the things that we currently have in place. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time, Melissa. Thank you, Naomi. I hope this is good. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think so. That's it for this episode. Thanks for tuning in. We hope that you enjoyed it as much as we enjoy doing the show. Join us next time for another episode of Living Blind. Special thanks to today's guests, John Ray and Melissa Smith, our host Naomi, and the entire team at Balance for Blind Adults. If you liked what you heard today, feel free to subscribe or follow us on whatever platform you're listening on. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Balance for Blind Adults. For more information about Balance for Blind Adults and our programs and services, please visit us at www.balancefba.org. I'm our producer, Troy Taylor, and this has been Living Blind. Thanks for listening.